Okay, so picking up with Learning Objective 6, now we're going to take all that information we've obtained about the client, about the environment, about the internal control uh, over financial reporting, and do a risk assessment of material misstatements, so essentially quantify or at least um, uh, designate the different levels of inherent risk and control risk, and then using our um, audit risk that was set for the engagement, uh, calculate our detection risk and then our subsequent um, procedures. So when I'm looking at this first piece here, I'll, we'll kind of say the first piece is really kind of the assessment of uh, the risk of material misstatement. And so we can think about the, the different possible misstatements that can come about, um, recognizing revenue that, we have, that the company hasn't earned. Uh, so obviously the fraudulent situation of that is when you're um, recording fake fake sales excuse me um, and the uh, error is more based on uh, there's an error in terms of when information is recorded or excuse me when the entries are recorded and they're not based on the correct trigger or the correct action right so for example if um, the firms were recording sales based on the receipt of orders because you know normally they ship goods out within a day and they just have adopted a custom that's uh, you know it's gradually gotten earlier and earlier to where once they get the receipt uh, of the order then they're they're booking the sales right that's an error in the sense of they're not intentionally trying to manipulate as much as um, they're uh, just having an inefficient are a billing process that's not directly connected to the shipping information, right? So if they if the billing department doesn't get notice of that shipment and it's just making assumptions, then that could also lead to errors. Um, and uh, obviously, not obviously, but a lot of times when we see fraud, um, the issue for fraud is usually around control environment uh, possibly monitoring um, those are the control weaknesses that that make fraud more uh, likely um, whereas a lot of the errors are more focused on specific you know ineffective controls or lack of controls for certain areas um, you know personnel issues uh, you know not having qualified personnel in the accounting functions for example um, and so they tend to be more specific, more closer, closer related to control activities rather than um, control environment type of items. Similar down here when we have this early recognition of revenue because we have a cutoff issue, right? So I, I mentioned this already, uh, holding that sales journal open to record, you know, some transactions from next year in order to try and inflate the current year's uh, performance. Right, and again, a very similar, actually the same kind of process there, or the same type of weakness is usually kind of an overall control environment weakness that allows for the fraud to occur or possibly um, incentivizes fraud, right? So if, if you have undue pressure to meet certain targets or certain, um, certain revenue targets, then that can lead to uh, a higher incentive for fraud okay um, and again the the error side of the cutoff problem would be um, maybe you're having incorrect shipping information right so possibly the shipping department is, is not um, uh, notifying uh, billing appropriately around Okay, so let's say you had some orders that were in the last week of the year, and then um, they don't get shipped until the next year, even though normally uh, they would get shipped within the amount of time that billing expects. But because shipping isn't notifying billing appropriately, then um, uh, that error could occur, right? Again, kind of a control issue, a process issue. So some other misstatements here that are possible. Um, recording revenue when there's a lot of uncertainty, right? So this is where a lot of the um, revenue recognition tries to provide some guidance. Um, you know, if there's substantial right to return 
uh, depending on how much uh, there is a right to return clause then that could dramatically impact the amount of revenue that should be recognized at the time of sale right again um, that's the fraudulent aspect and so um, if you're intentionally putting a really substantial right to return or the, the client is rather putting in substantial right to return rights around returning um, so for example if you know they they sell to a, a retailer and they say hey whatever products or goods you don't sell we will you can return them um, for a, a refund of the, of the money right that's a pretty substantial amount of right of return and so if they're not setting up the proper um, allowance for that then um, that's a, a way to manipulate uh, revenue um, all right, so again, I don't need to go through every single one of these. Um, reporting revenue when there's significant services or performance obligations that need to be performed, right? That's, again, a lot of the uh, new revenue recognition standard is, or the newer revenue, revenue recognition standard is uh, trying to account for these additional performance obligations and how do you separate out the amount of revenue that's related to the sale and how much is really related to the performance obligations and so um, again you're seeing the same thing for fraud it's all about the control environment in terms of um, not acknowledging that a substantial portion of that the revenue really should not be recognized in the period of the sale but rather should be recognized as the time of those performance obligations either the timing of those um, expires or as those performance obligations are actually being met right and so again doing that intentionally is the fraud side um, miscalculating things uh, uh, would be on the error side as an example um, right franchises actually there's some pretty interesting franchise accounting um, you know so it's an interesting economic model to have a franchise and sometimes those contracts um, are not straightforward they're not always just you get a percentage of sales Right, the franchisor uh, gets a percentage of sales from the franchisee. Sometimes they're more complex than that, and so um, that can be uh, easily uh, miscalculated. Right, so again, these are potential misstatements that can occur um, in the revenue process. And then lastly, um, another potential misstatement is uh, just overestimating the amount of revenue that was earned. Right. Um, software is an especially tricky area of revenue recognition, um, right? And so you might have contracts related to the initial deployment um, of software. You might have uh, estimates around, you know, software patches and fixes and but you know updates and all these things that are gonna that are really part of this sale. So how much of that sale? That the delivery of the, the software or installation needs to be withheld for future um, performance. Um, uh, construction is another area where this revenue recognition is not a trivial exercise of trying to think about how do we recognize revenue through the process, right? The long, potentially long construction process. Um, at what point are you earning? revenue and how much of that revenue have you actually earned um, and then again uh, so those are potential ways areas that can be manipulated and again a lot of this is kind of the um, control environment focus um, you know incentives for aggressive reporting of revenue or aggressive targets those are that of that nature and then again with complexity there's always a potential for misapplication right uh, it could be due to maybe there's a new industry um, and so really the guidance is unclear for exactly how this new transaction and this new contract should be recognized um, but there also could be issues in terms of not having competent and trained individuals around how to do proper recognition given the particulars of revenue recognition for that industry and firm so again, moving through our audit risk model here, uh, after I'm doing that risk assessment, thinking about my material statements, thinking about how the inherent risk, control risk is set up, 
I've already got my set audit risk. I can calculate what my allowable detection risk is. And then I'm going to start um, designing uh, further procedures, um, which include control testing and substantive testing. All right, there we go. A little split out of those two. Um, and so, again, some examples here of control testing. And obviously, the control testing is going to depend on the internal control, uh, the internal controls that are actually present at the particular firm you're auditing, right? So not every firm has the same set of controls, even though there might be some similarities, especially across firms in the same industry. Um, and so you're going to have to think about, uh, based on your review of the design, right, which is that initial um, review, obtain an understanding of the internal controls, think about control risks, think about do I want to rely on controls here, and then based on my decision and based on how good um, those controls appear based on the design, then I, as an auditor, decide what I want to test. Right? And so um, obviously uh, you can, let's say you had a bunch of um, sales transactions with terms associated with them, right, as far as delivery, um, shipping terms, all those things you would look to, you'd want to sample those sales transactions, maybe looking at sales contracts. Based on the terms um, and based on when those performance obligations were met, did the firm recognize revenue appropriately, right? Um, if shipment is what dictates the determination of whether revenue has been earned, then do I see that um, sh every time I had an item that was shipped, was there an invoice created and, and consequently a, a, a re was revenue booked? And so we can go two ways, right? And if we go, um, if that's like one and that's two, if we go one to two, then, um, ooh, that's a bad two, one to two, then um, that is completeness, right? I'm gonna look at a sample of shipping docu documents or possibly the whole population, and then look to see um, did, did those result in an invoice being billed and consequently the revenue being reported. If I'm gonna start with the invoices or even start with what has been booked as revenue and then go back to one, then that's really getting that existence. So based on what was recorded, can I find support um, in terms of there being a shipping document, right? So even though we're gonna compare these two, um, the direction determines whether uh, which assertion we're actually testing. Okay, uh, obviously IT application controls can uh, can play a part here. So let's say that you have to have a certain level of authorization in order to trigger a shipment of a, a document. So let's say um, credit authorization has to be obtained, and there's a um, an IT control that basically in the ERP system says, okay, we're not going to send anything uh, to the warehouse to be pulled and then ultimately the shipping department to be shipped unless there's an actual credit check. And so one test of the IT controls would be to look for shipments and then verify that those shipments have all been, um, have all gone through the credit check and been approved, right? That would be an example of testing, and so um, you could do that through samples, you could do that through observation, but you could also do that through data analytics where you're going to acquire the data on the shipments and then um, uh, compare that with uh, some record of whether a credit check has been done or not. Okay, so those again, these are examples of test controls you can do. Obviously, you're going to have to tailor the, the testing to the controls that are present and the controls that appear to be designed um, effectively. And then the results of those tests are going to update your, your new control risk, right? Your, now you'll have your assessed control risk. Um, and so then that's going to lead into your new estimate of the detection risk. DR is the detection risk. And so um, that could change it. So if your control risk changes based on the testing, then that could change the substantive testing you were planning to do, right? 
So we're going to plan this out first with an initial idea based on the design of the internal controls, based on our decision whether to rely on the controls or not. Come up with a set of uh, procedures, substantive procedures, do our control testing, um, and then based on the results, possibly update the control risk, the assess control risk, which then leads to a new estimate of our detection risk, which could lead to a different um, scope like, of the substantive procedures based on the nature, timing, and extent. Okay? In any time, and this is a good figure, all these figures that kind of connect a control with a test, uh, or really a test with the assertions slash all objectives, those are good to make sure you understand. Um, because again, we want to make sure that we're not just doing tests for the sake of doing tests. We want to do tests that actually give us comfort around the audit objectives that are based on the significant accounts and the assertions that we care about, right? And so if you look at uh, some of these tests, some of which we've already mentioned, um, right? If I look at uh, something simple, right, where I'm estimating, where I'm basically taking a sample of, well, the control rather is that the um, a second person looks at the accuracy of the sales invoices. So they have someone create it and then someone else is going to review it for accuracy. Right? That's, an, that's clearly going to be related to that accuracy um, assertion slash art objective. And so how do we test it? We're going to go and take a sample of invoices and then actually look for evidence of that review. Right? So looking for evidence of the review gives us comfort whether or not that review is actually done. So if, if the firm, assuming the firm documents that review, whether it's manual or electronic, we want to see evidence that that review is actually done to get comfort around whether that control uh, appears to be effective, operating effectively or not. Okay, um, you know, getting uh, approval prior to shipment, um, and so. Right, one, what does that do? Anytime you get approval, it really, you can think about approval, something that's approved means it's valid, right? And so validity is, is tied in with existence um, and occurrence, right? Occurrence is just validity of the transaction. The existence is just validity of the balance. But validity is kind of at the heart of that, uh, com that, that assertion there. And so um, how do we see or how do we test that control? Well, again, we can look at a sample of the sales transactions and look for evidence of the credit approval. Or, if again, using data analytics, we can gather the entire population of uh, sales transactions. And then, hopefully, there will be documentation in the data of whether or not there was a credit approval done. right? And so then we can test the entire population and say, are there any sales transactions that don't have a credit approval? Um, and if the results come back and say, nope, there weren't any, every single one had approval, then we feel good that that's operating effectively, right? So again, depending on if we're going to do this in a sample basis or using data analytics and test the whole population, that would help. Um, and at the same time, um, we could also look to see, or rather, that control also helps with accuracy, right? In the sense of um, there should be or rather, excuse me, evaluate, uh, no, it would be accuracy in the sense of making sure that the, um, the sales are actually correct, right? The number's correct based on the credit approval. All right, um, and obviously some of these hit multiple um, assertions slash audit objectives, and that's okay. Um, it's nice if you have a control that can do hit multiple assertions at once. Um, but we just want to make sure that we're getting coverage on the assertions that uh, we um, that we really want, right? Uh, also, a bank rec. We did a bank rec or talked about a uh, bank rec with the cash topic, and so uh, there we would again uh, validity is a big deal there. Accuracy of the the records is also being tested there. Um, it also helps us with uh, rights to the accounts, um, and so that would uh, help us with uh, those assertions, and we can just review a sample of the reconciliations during the year.
okay? And so, um, and even though we talked about that with cash, it, it also relates here because it, uh, we verify the cash receipts, right? Um, and the, because those will go into deposits and those cash receipts would reduce accounts receivables. That helps us get some comfort around the, um, uh, the valuation of um, uh, cash receipts, okay, and that those transactions are valid. Okay, and just in general, these are good reminders of the different controls that can be present in a given transaction cycle, how we can typically test the control, and then the assertion slash auto objectives that would be covered by those uh, tests. Right? And it's really important we'll be able to connect those.